Good morning, everybody. Morning. Who's happy to be here this morning? Amen. Uh, got a few. Anybody else want to change your answer? <laughs> Who's happy to be here this morning? All right, that's that's a lot better. All right, who had a who had a good week this week? All right, <laughs> Cassie, good week. Who had a maybe I don't want to say a bad week, but a not so good week? Well, that's that's okay too. Cause you know what? We're here in church this morning, and no matter what happened this week. We're here this morning to worship the Lord, and we can put all that aside if you had a good one, if you had a not-so-good one. We're here to worship the Lord and just to thank Jesus for all that he's done for us. So looking Amen. forward to the service, looking forward to the week and Bible school next week. But uh, join with me this morning. All those in need of a prayer, just maybe by an uplifted hand. All right. So join with me as we pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and just thank you for another beautiful morning, God, to be in your house. We know it's rainy outside, but we thank you for the rain. Uh, rain can be beautiful just the same way as sunshine can because we know that you provide us with exactly what we need. Lord, we pray that you be with us in this service this morning, the songs we sing, the message that we hear would all be according to your plan and would help each one of us to grow closer to you. Be with us throughout the week as we look forward to Bible school, God. We want to spread the love of Jesus through the community, through the kids, but also to the parents, God. And we know you're preparing people to be here and preparing us to work and get ready for Bible school. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. It's good to be in God's house, and it's good to be uh, back. We had a wonderful time at youth camp, and we will have a youth camp Sunday where we're going to share a lot of what went on, and uh, it was amazing. Um, the Lord really moved and worked and it was uh, it shouldn't be uncommon but it was should be the norm for youth camp but we were able to uh, just have a wonderful time of the lord we baptized 10 on sunday yeah so uh, i think that's pretty good don't you i'm thankful because of the cross of calvary because of jesus we have something to sing about we have something to praise the lord for amen Glory to His name. Glory 
the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and the joy in the Holy Ghost. delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of this earth when we delight in him he will lift us to heavenly places and my prayer is I want to go higher with the Lord don't you Amen. Yeah. 
what you're singing there? Go back to that verse. I want to live above this world. I want to live above all the news stories, all the political stuff, all the stuff that's going on in our country and in the world. That means we don't pray for it, but we don't worry about it. I want to live above the world, no Satan star, and me on earth, for faith has gone, the joyous sound, the song of saints on higher ground, Lord let me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven. trouble we can see now amen rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen for the things we see now will soon be gone amen but the things we cannot see will last forever second corinthians 4 18 and that's the new living translation
nothing is better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you there is nothing and he takes all of our faults and failures and changes us into people that are more like him. And I'm thankful for that. I'm going to ask Adley to come and Taylor. And uh, We sang this song in camp. We've sang it here too, and it fit our camp theme. Uh, and Adley asked if she could sing it today. And I, this song is simply called Goodbye Old Me. Now, it goes by really, really fast. So we put the words on the screen so you can follow along. It's just thanking the Lord for a new life. And goodbye to the old me. He's going to plug it in for you. Look what he's done I've been set free Every mistake He washed me clean When I lost my way An amazing grace found me Goodbye on me I'm not myself It's no longer me that's living It's like I'm someone else He rescued me Loose me from hell well, I'm giving up what I was holding Up, let him say so. Let him take him to the Lord. Let him say so. The second tries up like the morning sun. Let him say so. Well, I'm never gonna go back. I'm never gonna turn back. I'm never gonna go back. So long I do farewell. Goodbye, oh me. I'm not myself. Well, it's no longer me that's living. It's like I'm someone else. He rescued me. Loose me from hell. Well, I'm giving. What I was holding So long I do farewell Goodbye on me We saw this group do that song Live in concert And I heard I may have heard it before, but when they did it, I was like, well, that's awesome. I love that. I just don't know if I could get away sing, singing that in church because I don't think I could sing that. And Adley goes, Triple, I want to do that song. So we looked for a soundtrack because I thought there's no way that I can play that. So you got to give me a minute to get the <laughs> circulation back in my hands. Uh, but you know... What a message. And yeah, it goes by pretty quick. But it's a message to the devil and to the world. Goodbye, old me. And you know, sometimes we've got to remind ourselves and sing that again. When we find ourselves going back to the old things we want to lean into. Not sinful things necessarily, but those old attitudes. Or if somebody we get in a little maybe a disagreement with and 
you know, instead of getting hysterical, they get historical, and they want to remind you about what you used to be, you've got to say goodbye, old me. No, that's not me anymore. I'm sorry that I did that in the past, but I, I'm not going to answer to that name anymore. We spent all week of camp talking about what we answer to now, our new name in Christ. And uh, it's a good one. They're all good. And as we go through this series of the gospel story, we're reminded of what God did from the very beginning creating us. And he wanted us to be not robots, but people that would serve him and love him willingly. So he had to give us free will. Well, because of that, we made the choice to go the wrong way. And now we live in a world that has been affected and infected by sin. And all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God when you get to the age of knowing right from wrong. But God in his mercy gave us the gospel story so that we would see that Jesus came, lived, died, rose again for my sin and your sin, that when we accept him, it's not just coming and filling a pew on Sunday morning, it's a relationship with him every day. And when we live that way, then, you know, when the news comes on, we don't have to go to pieces. Amen. This is as political as I'll get. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. My being and your being, if we lift up Jesus, we're not donkeys or elephants. We're lions following the king of kings. No political party is going to save us. Yes, should we vote for biblical values and try to get them back in our society? Absolutely. But I'm not hanging my hat on them. By the way, anybody that runs for president, vice president, assistant dog catcher, I don't care who they are. They are not God. They are not Jesus. Don't lift them up that high because they'll let you down. That was all for free. You're welcome. Okay, now... Just as I am standing here today warning you not to put political powers up here and not to think just because you're a Christian you got it made, you don't. We still live in a sinful world, right? Amen. And because we live in a sinful world, there are consequences to other people's sin that affect us. Well, that's not fair. Guess what? Life's not fair. When sin entered the world, unfairness became the rule. You want fairness? That's God. God is just and merciful. Yeah. I'm just getting warmed up. I've been gone a week, so y'all just hold on, okay? We're, been, we're talking about the prophets right now. We're going through, uh, we went through uh, Jonah last, or two weeks ago, and uh, we're in the minor prophets, and they're called the minor prophets because their books were shorter. They were not as... Um, made as such a mark in the time that they lived, but that doesn't mean that we brush over them. And we don't have time to go through all the minor prophets. A few years ago, we did the whole summer called Summer in the Minors, and we spent time in the minor prophets. Uh, that was uh, about seven years ago, if you could remember that. So uh, we're going to give you a little refresher about Amos. Now, Amos is one of my favorite prophets, and I'm going to tell you why. Because Amos is just Amos. And as we get into this, you're going to realize there's a lot for us here and for our world today. Now, this is not on the screen, but I just want you to get this really quickly. Amos chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but Amos was from a place called Tekoa. That's the only time it's mentioned in Scripture. That's the only time we hear about it. Tekoa was not even on the trade route going to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was a little tiny city. But Tekoa wasn't even on the trade route for when the butter and egg man would come by. They weren't, Tekoa wasn't even on the map. They had to go to another smaller place to get their groceries. Hmm. 
Now, I know nobody in here knows anything about that. And they didn't have a new family dollar on the corner either. Amos lived in Tekoa. Now, when you hear Tekoa, think back holler. Think country. Amos, by occupation, was not a prophet. There were others in his time period that God had called from birth as prophets. Their families were religious families who had followed God and so God had called them. We see Micah, we see Isaiah. They were called as prophets, not Amos. When you think of Amos, Amos was a country boy. Amos was at home in the field. Amos didn't want to leave his farm. Amos today would probably be eating cornbread, soup, beans, and sauerkraut and weenies. Amos would be a guy I'd like to hang with. Amos was rough, tough, hard to bluff, never tasted quiche, was not a guy to be messed with, and he liked to be in the country. But God called him out of Judah into Jerusalem. And he didn't want to go, but he went. In fact, and we won't read this, we won't see this on the screen, but I wanted to give you this background quickly. He says in verse, in chapter 7, he describes himself because he's now in the temple, the high place, Bethel, in Jerusalem, and he's talking to the high priest, and the high priest is getting aggravating at him because he's telling them what God has told him. And all of his visions, I love God, because God works with who we are. All of his visions are farm analogies. I love it. In fact, he's telling the high priest that he had a vision of a plumb line. You know what a plumb line is? Keeps things level. Well, the plumb line was off center. He said, what does this mean? He said, Israel is off center. They need to get back to me. Judgment is coming. They need to get back to me. Well, the high priest didn't like that. And he said, what are you, you old prophet? And this is what Amos told him. He told him in chapter 7 that I'm not a prophet. I'm a herdsman, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm a herdsman, I'm a shepherd. So he would have sheep, and he, did, and he ran cattle. And he said, I also, catch this, I also harvest fig trees, or fig, figs, and they're called cedar figs, I think. And that's a certain type of fig. Now that may not mean anything to you, but this man shows up in the high places wearing, do you think he dressed up? No. He's wearing what he always wore. He told them, God called me. I didn't really want to go. I'm not a prophet. And my parents aren't prophets. I'm just a farmer. That's what he says in chapter 7. I'm just a farmer. But this is, I've been sent to tell you that you need to get yourself straight with the Lord because righteousness and justice are going to flow down like a river. His righteousness, his right being, and judgment is going to flow down. you got to get it together, Israel. And they didn't want to listen. And so he tells them that I'm just a farmer. I just do that. I just harvest figs. And it's not just going and picking fruit off a fig tree, these were the type of figs that were hard. You couldn't eat them unless you, somebody pierced it, drained it, and then mashed it. And when you mashed it, it stained your hands red. Now, you would not go into the high temple with red hands and shepherd's clothes. But he did. 
He was different than what they expected. He was different. He reacted different to their surroundings. He didn't coddle them. He didn't say, oh, it's all right. You can do this and that. No, he said, wait a minute. You boys better get it together because if you don't, justice is coming. God's righteousness is coming. He was telling them too that there is a famine in the land and it was not of food it was of the word of God you know what I think we're kind of living there today don't you I bet you could probably count on two hands and have to borrow two others of how many Bibles you have in your house But if we were to ask the average Christian today what's in there, they wouldn't know. I saw a video not too long ago where they had people that were average church attenders answer questions. Is this in the Bible? Is it not? Did you know all but three of them failed? Oh, well, you know, I, you know, Brother Brian, you the preacher, you the one supposed to know all the Bible and tell us. Well, that's, yeah, that's some of it, but you're supposed to read it for yourself. Because here's the thing, do you know why I want you to bring your Bible to church? Because if I read something that ain't in there, you need to know it. And be like, wait a minute, he's not, he's not on the bubble right there. Right? If I teach something that's contrary to this book, then I'm wrong. Not the Bible's wrong, I'm wrong. Does that make sense? And that's what was Amos was doing. He was letting them know, hey, you better straighten up and fly right. And I know you're thinking, go, oh, well, this is, this is a real exciting message. Well, this might not be a shouting message. This might not be an amen, hallelujah message, but it's a necessary message that's in the gospel story. Because I'm thankful that God not only sent his son, but he still sends people, voices in the wilderness, crying out saying, hey, judgment's going to come, you better get it together. And I also, love, here's three things we can learn from the book of Amos. First of all, if you follow God, he can use you. It does not matter. Your pedigree, it doesn't matter who you are. We have all been called. Well, I'm not a called to preach. Think back for a minute. I want you to think back. I'm sure in your spiritual journey, if you're following the Lord, there have been people that were not preachers. But they poured into you, they gave you Bible knowledge that you ne desperately needed, right? I could sit here and be here today all the way till tomorrow and y'all don't have time for that to tell you of the men and women of God who were not preachers who poured into this little boy because they saw something I didn't. Those back row saints in my church in Virginia that from when I was a little boy would call me over to them and put me on their lap and say, God's got a plan for you. We love you. He gave me nicknames and gave me candy and rubbed my little head and I loved every minute of it. But they were pouring into me. Were they preachers? No. Harold Huntsberger, who was a lay preacher and a deacon and at 85 years old looked me in the eye and said, Son, don't ever think you know it all. I'm 80 years old and God's still showing me something. And he held up his old Bible and he said, The Word of God is still teaching me. And I never forgot that. Yeah. Ed Carpenter, who was never a famous preacher, but came to our church in Dunloring and sang bluegrass and ignited a fire in me that, that, that music didn't have to be just old slow hymns, but they could be gospel songs that were fun and had a meaning. And I'll never forget that. And that man could preach, and he preached just like who he was. He's Brother Ed no matter where he is. 
And I love that about him. Did he ever have a high pulpit? No. But you know what? He's known all around the world because people love him and he's just who he is. And do you think he waters down the gospel? Absolutely not. He'll tell you that Jesus is coming. He'll tell you that there, that there is judgment coming. But we can be born again, as he says, and live a new life in Christ. And in the words of Ed Carpenter, he'll look at you dead on and say, don't that just turn you on? It should. And he is who he is. And I never forgot that. And he poured into me. And he would say, don't let him look down on you, Brother Brian. You're a giant for Jesus. Ooh, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. And I could go on and on. Brother and Sister Wood who saw this little boy and even when I would tease and when email came out and said, I, my email is badleg at juno.com. Sister Wood pulled me aside and said, Honey, you need to change that because you don't have a bad leg. God gave you that and you, you need to give Him glory. And they encouraged me and they allowed me to preach and they allowed me to teach and they fostered the gifts that were in me. Did they ever take a world stage? No! But God used them. And I could go on and on and on. And so, I think of Sister Maida and Sister Mildred, who were my Sunday school teachers, who had women in their home and taught them the Bible. And then Sister Mildred wasn't satisfied with just the little baby she had in her kindergarten class. She wanted more. She wanted to let the world know that Jesus loved them, that the world, she was concerned even back then that the world was coming to an end and she wanted those kids to get in church because she knew if the kids got in church, parents would follow. And she took her old hatchback, it was blue. I don't remember what kind it was. I just know it rattled. And she begged the pastors to buy her, by the church, a bus. And they bought an old school bus. And Mildred Mock would go out on Saturdays in her little car. Now remember, this is the late 70s, early 80s. Times were different. With a bullhorn, driving with one hand. Now did I mention she was 75 years old? Yelling in the hood. She would go to these neighborhoods where people with my skin tone wasn't allowed to go. And she had the same skin tone. She'd be yelling with a bullhorn. Y'all come, come to church. And she would name the church address and she'd drive around. And then Brother Wiley and Sister Mildred would ride that bus down to that neighborhood and they would fill it with kids that had never heard about Jesus. That one lady lit a fire And in the late 80s, early 90s, the Dunloran Community Church of God had eight buses. Eight buses. And they had a man named John Bailey who went to be with the Lord. And we love John Bailey. John Bailey wasn't a preacher. But John Bailey would come morning, noon, or night to keep those old buses on the road because... <laughs> eight buses <laughs> that were not new buses they were special buses from other nations, donations and John Bailey we'd, we'd be going to youth camp and that bus would break down you talk about kids that were spiritual we had to be, we had to pray that the bus would get there and he'd show up on the side of the road and look like he had, he had a bag full of tools, bailing wire and chewing gum and he'd get those he'd get those buses running and I remember his quiet spirit and just working and humming hymns. And I never forgot that. He preached the gospel and never said a word for his faithfulness and his love. And I learned that from him. You know, 
Amos teaches us, first of all, that it doesn't matter who we are when we answer God's call. We all have a job to do, and that is to live our life, to let the world know that judgment is coming, and some of it's already here, and if you want to escape it, hold on to Jesus. Not just religion, not just church, not just evangelicalism. I hate that word because politics have hijacked it. It's true. I don't even like Christian anymore. I mean, if somebody calls me, then I'm not going to get offended because it means Christ-like. But we've used it as just a little badge. No, I'm a follower of Christ. And my job is to live that every day. To live like Jesus. At camp we learned that, didn't we guys? We learned that uh, to be a follower of Jesus, to abide in Jesus, is to be like Jesus. What did Jesus do? Jesus knew scripture. Right? Jesus prayed all the time. He communicated with his Father. Jesus rested. And the church should say... Vance Havner, the old Baptist preacher, said, if you don't come apart and rest a while, you'll just plain come apart. I'm learning it. I'm not there yet. Jesus rested. In fact, when all the world was going crazy in the disciples' mind, when that boat was rocking, where was Jesus? Resting. Down in the bottom of the ship. Oh, but he was the Son of God. He was, but he was also man, and he needed rest. And he showed us that. Did he have to show us that? No, but he did. Think of that. Why did Jesus do the things that he did? If he was all God and all man, then why did he do it that way? Because he was doing it as an example for us. Lastly, he was part of a community. He was part of a community. Church. Not just Sunday morning. A community of believers. And, and, you know, some of us don't live close in this community. So sometimes we've got friends that love Jesus that are part of a community. Youth camp has become a community. And it's easy. They all text each other on their phones and, you know. But when times get tough, they can reach out. Before youth camp, a couple of them reached out to me going, are you going to be at youth camp, you know, checking in and all that. And they ask questions through the year. One thing I'm thankful for that helps community, and you, a lot of you don't even realize that we do it, is we have youth group on Sunday nights through Zoom. We've never started back in person. There's a reason for that. Because there are people, there are young people, that love their youth group, but they're not getting fed like they should. Nothing against their youth group. Or they want a little something extra. They want to move up a little bit. I love teenagers like that, don't you? Yeah. I'll teach them. Send them to me and Sister Christy. And our youth group mascot, Rudy, the Wonder Chihuahua. Because <laughs> we wonder why he sits there so long, but he does. But as we look at Amos, Amos reminds us that we are here for a purpose, even though we may not fit the mold the world thinks we should fit, even the church thinks we should fit at times. Secondly, our message never changes. Amos here, he's going to the religious people who think they've got it made. They're the Israelites. They're, they, they think they've got it. They're in a high time. The political climate is good. They've not, they've not been attacked in a while. But because they've gotten eased, they're on easy street, they've let false gods come in. Now, when you read this in the King James, you're going to scratch your head and say, do, huh? Because that's what I do sometimes. Woe unto you, this is Amos talking to the high priest and the kids going to the king. Now, he's talking to Israelites who are God's chosen people. They think if they're not saved, nobody else is, right? They think we got it. We're God's chosen. He says, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? 
So he's saying, woe unto you. Wait a minute. Who's going around the temple singing about, we want the day of the Lord, we want the Lord to come back. He's saying, wait a minute. Because the way you're living right now, it's not going to be good. Because God's coming back with righteousness and judgment. He'll come back with mercy, but he's also coming back with righteousness and judgment. To what end is this for you? The day of the Lord for you is darkness and not light. It's not going to be a good thing the way you're living right now. As if a man did flee from a lion. So you get that? It's just like if a man ran from a lion and then a bear met him. So he got away from the lion and then a bear ate him up. Yeah. So you think it's going to be good, you've made it because you're God's chosen, but wait a minute. Or you went into the house after you got away, maybe you got away from the lion, and maybe you barely escaped the bear, and you got to a house and you leaned against the wall, and a snake run up the wall and bit you. Yeah, y'all didn't know that was in there, did you? Yeah. Is that happy times? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm just going to tell you. First of all, if I ran from a lion and got away, I would be so happy I wouldn't know what to do. But then if I seen a bear, I watch cartoons. Now, I know what you're supposed to do with a bear. You're supposed to lay down and play dead, right? So I'd fall down and play dead, but I probably couldn't get up real good. Then once I got up and run away from him, if I got away from him and leaned against the wall and I just saw the snake, Oh, he wouldn't even have to bite me. I'd just go on to glory. I'd just be dead right there. He wouldn't even have to. He'd just crawl up the wall and say, hey, i say, uh-uh, bye. I'm done. But that's what he's painting here. Now, keep in mind, all of his imagery is what? It's livestock. It's simple. It's not the elegant imagery of Isaiah. It's not the... the uh, the biblical language of Micah, it is simple talk. And he says, Shall not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? For you, it's going to be real dark. There's not going to be no light for you because you're turning away from me. You're turning away from God. I hate, I despise your feast days. I despise all your religious celebrations. They mean nothing. God says they mean nothing to him because you're worshiping other gods. And I will not, sm uh, I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Now what does that mean? That mean God's got a sinus condition? No. When they would offer up incense, it was an offering. He said, when you offer that incense, I'm not going to smell it. I don't want to smell it because it's not what I want. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. I'm not going to give you the... Remember we went through all that back around Easter time, what the different offerings meant? I'm not going to honor any of them. Forgiveness, peace, none of them. And then take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. I'm not going to hear the instruments that you play and the songs you sing. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have you offered me unto sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of your Molech, and Cheon, your images, the star of your God which you made to yourselves. Don't you remember? You used to worship me in the, tab, in, the, in the bad times in the wilderness. Remember that? But now you're too busy worshiping Moloch and Chion. And we've talked about those gods. They were gods that wanted infant sacrifice. Moloch did. Ooh. I'm getting there, hold on. 
Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts, or the God of angel armies. He is the God of armies. Justice and righteousness will roll down. This is very military language. This is very common language. This is a, a man who knows how to fight to protect his property. So he's using that language because he's reminding them that, hey, y'all got to straighten up. Because judgment's coming. What's that mean for us? Thirdly, we must proclaim the gospel, the good news, and part of that is letting people know that judgment is coming, that sin is there, and we have all sinned. But there is a remedy, and His name is is Jesus. You know, we've been looking at the three main characters in Scripture, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God was speaking through Amos, but where is Jesus? Jesus is what? When we accept Him, He becomes what for us? Adley sang about it. He becomes our righteousness. He is in Amos the righteousness of God. The right standing of God. But that with judgment, because right standing cannot look on sin. You can't be right and be sinful. You with me? Oh, there's, a, there's doctrines out there today that will tell you, uh, you can do whatever you want, get saved and still go to heaven. And then still do what you want after you get saved. And you, you always say, no, hold on. The Bible doesn't teach that. When we accept Jesus, there may be a possibility for sin, but the probability goes way down because as we walk in the Holy Spirit, it will keep us from falling. Amen. That's abiding, that's walking with Jesus, that's living like Jesus. And how did Jesus live? He fought the enemy with scripture that was in his heart. He prayed to his father every day and talked to him in communication. And then he had a time of rest. He didn't always run all the time. Amen. And he had community that helped bolster him. There it is. When we start doing that, the church will grow. Now, the enemy will fight it, but the church will grow. And we need to let a world know that there is judgment, but there is a remedy. If we were to look at Amos as a house, and Amos, the book of Amos, is the main structure, and the two points are a roof, this side would be that God will use you wherever you are. You don't have to have a high degree. Now, God wants us to study this book. You with me? But you, if you're saved, and you're truly saved, and you've accepted Jesus, you know the goodness of God. You know His mercy. You know His grace. And you know that there's judgment that He saved you from. And your family, your friends, and the world out there needs to know that. Then the other piece is Israel. If you're in a state that Israel is in, they think... They're all right, but they're not. They're examining their self. They, they've got to examine their self. And I would challenge every believer to look in the mirror of the God's word and do like David and say, Search me, O God, and search any wicked way that might be in me. But also, the world is like Israel, saying, you know, we're a Christian nation in our politics. We always want to, one side always wants to tap into the Christians. Let me put this in for free, okay? And this is as political as I'll get. Don't let either party use your walk with Jesus to manipulate you. Because many of the ones that stand, some are genuine, but some of it use it as a catchword just to get your vote. And it's true. This is how Brother Brian votes. I look at the issues. I look at their record. I look at what they're for. I look at what they're against. If what they're for leans more toward this and what they're against leans away from this, that's who I'm voting for. 
I know in the political climate it gets harder and harder to tell the difference. But I don't care who you're for or against. In politics, I just want you to be for Jesus and walk with him and then the rest of it will fall into place. I believe that. When, like my little friend Larry Brown from Jamaica would say, I believe that, Brother Brian, with all of my heart and both me kidneys. <laughs> okay, Brother Larry, I believe you're convinced. As we look at Amos today, we can realize that God has called us all to a purpose. When we are saved, because all of us have sinned, when we repent, turn away from that sin, we're sorry for it, not just sorry we got caught, but we turn away from that sin and we allow Jesus to come into our life, we allow the Holy Spirit, and by the way, this is for free, when you accept Jesus, you get a portion of the Holy Spirit. Now there will come a time when God's going to continue to deal with you and you might want to come back down and say, I just give you everything, Lord. There's more in my life that you're showing me as I'm growing that I need to give up and you're going to just continue to give me the Holy Spirit and we're going to keep growing. This is also for free. There's not one spiritual gift exercised over all of the others in Scripture that is an evidence of that you have the Holy Spirit or not. It's not biblical. You may disagree, but it's not in here. When you read scripture in context and not just pick a verse or two, it's not there. Now, we all should desire gifts of the Spirit, but not everybody's going to have the same gift. The Bible clearly teaches that. I know, I've gone to meddling now, I'm sorry. Well, really I'm not, it's just the truth. So... As we look at this, we must remember as we leave today that if we love Jesus, then we are called to love people and to let them know where they're going. Now, in the society, in the world we live in today, with everybody getting so offended about everything, I know, it hurts my head. We got to love them first, get beside them, earn the right to say stuff to them. Yeah. It's not like it was years ago. You can't just hand out a tract and they'll throw it away. It's living a life before them because this world is starving to see real. We had a service at youth camp and there was a man, he'd never been to youth camp before and that service ran, I think, about two and a half hours. It just kept going. Because young people were testifying, they were coming to the altar, they were praying for each other. God was moving. It was not a put on. My young people that were there, you, you testified to that, correct? Yeah, they'll tell you. That man came to me, he said, I've never seen nothing like that. He said, most kids come to church and they can't wait to leave. He said, these kids didn't want them to stop. I said, you know why? There was the difference. The Holy Spirit was here, God was here, and they were hungry for it, and it was real. It was real. I had somebody tell me today I could preach as long as I wanted to, as long as God was in it. I won't tell you who they are, so you won't send them no nasty notes. <laughs> but you know what? When God is in it, we don't look at our watch. Right? <laughs> I ain't going to say that. So... Uh, <laughs> As you read Amos, as you look at Amos, remember you are called if you love Jesus. If you're not, you better get it straight because judgment is coming. God's already judging this nation and it's not going to get any better until a revival sweeps this land and then he comes back and says, come on home, kids. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to hang on until Jesus calls me home because there is nothing better than him. We sang it, let's live it. 
Goodbye, old me. <laughs> Goodbye, old attitudes. Goodbye, old stuff that used to get on my nerves. I'm, on, I'm still working on it. Amen? I don't know what God has said to you today, but I know he's here. And I pray that you would listen. If you're listening on live stream today, I would pray that you would not only accept him into your heart and repent, but also that you would live for him every day. And you can do that wherever you are. I also would encourage you, though, if you're, if you're close to here, plug into this community of believers. If you're not, find another community of believers to plug into, that teach the Bible, that live for Jesus every day. God bless you.